Let us talk about fluid compartments now. So fluid, and especially water, makes up 60% of our total body weight. Okay, 40% is tissue and everything else that's not fluid. 60% is made up of water. And that's, that. all that water is divided up into different body compartments. A lot of it is inside the cell, intracellular. Two-thirds of total body water is intracellular in our cells. That's intracellular fluid. The rest of the fluid we call extracellular fluid. And that could be in the interstitium, in between cells, or it could be in the plasma, okay? And that makes up one third of total body water, is extracellular fluid. And the way you can remember that is with the 60, 40, 20 rule. Because 60% of total body weight is water, and then two thirds of that total water is intracellular, so 40% of total body weight is intracellular. And then finally, 20% um, of total body weight is extracellular. Now for ions, intracellular fluid, and especially the one you want to remember is, has a lot of K+. Plus. There's a lot of K plus in these cells, okay? K, K plus is mainly intracellular, and then extracellular fluid mainly has NaCl and bicarb, especially the Na is what we care about. So Na, Na is extracellular, okay? Now, water and some molecules can shift between these fluid, fluid compartments. They can cross the cell membrane, so they can cross this membrane and, sh and shift, either way, or they can cross capillary walls, so you can have crossing here or here. And the driving force for water movement is changes in osmolarity. It's important, I've bolded it, and I'm gonna say it one more time. The driving force for water movement, what is that? The driving force is changes in osmolarity. I'm gonna illustrate that, okay. And I'm gonna illustrate that through showing you disturbances of body fluids. You should be able to understand what's gonna happen. Now the disturbances of body fluids is going to occur in the extracellular space. I need to emphasize that it occurs. This, the primary disturbance is going to occur in the extracellular space. So that's in the plasma or the fluid in the interstitium. And then the intracellular fluid volume or the extracellular fluid will shift in a manner. And what do we say with the driving force? It's changes in osmolarity. And it's going to shift in a manner in order to main os maintain osmolarity between the ICF and the ECF. So the key to understand how water will shift is understand how the disturbance will change e ECF osmolarity. So let's talk about it. So first disturbance is an isoosmotic volume contraction. For example, something like diarrhea, where you're losing both fluid and just different molecules at pretty much the same, same rate so that the concentration of your extracellular fluid stays the same. And we're going to use these little graphs to illustrate these, okay? Volume here is on this on this x-axis. So if you see, let's say increase volume. This would show you increase ECF volume. And then osmolarity is the height, okay? So this is the normal height. So if it was higher, then you would have a higher osmolarity. So in this case, we have an isoosmotic volume contraction. So osmolarity is the same. So height's the same. But we went left because we lost volume. So what is going to happen? Where will water shift? Well, we said the key is this: how will, how will ECF osmolarity change? Well, we see the ICF osmolarity has not changed. So guess what? There's going to be no water movement. So there's no water movement. So basically, your ECF volume is, stays down. ICF volume is the same. Osmolarity is the same. OK, next one would be hypoosmotic volume contraction. That means you lost the volume and your osmolarity went down. And that could be something like an adrenal insufficiency. You'll learn more about that later and in the endocrine section especially. It happens in the kidney where you're not reabsorbing your, your different electrolytes like salt. And so that means your osmolarity goes down and then um, water is going to follow that salt. So you're going to be volume contraction. So you can see in this graph, osmolarity is down, as you can see, and your volume is down. It's moved a little bit left. So where is water going to go? Where water always goes, from low to high osmolarity, water wants to equalize the osmolarity. So low osmolarity is here, high osmolarity is here, water will go this way. Okay, I've drawn a I've drawn an arrow there. So what will our net thing what will our net ECF volume be? Net ECF volume will be down. And then what will our net ICF volume be? Well we just have extra water coming in, so ICF volume actually goes up. 
And then how will our net osmolarity be? Well, you had a decreased osmolarity. It's going to equalize a little bit, but overall, compared to normal, your osmolarity goes down. Okay, that osmolarity goes down. Next, we talk about hyperosmotic volume expansion. That means that your osmolarity goes up and your volume goes up. Oops. Osmolarity went up, volume goes up. That could come from just getting a hypertonic saline infusion that's a lot of NaCl in it. That's more than your body normally has. Or maybe it's eating, going to McDonald's too much and having a, a large fries. That causes a lot of sodium in your blood and increases your osmolarity and the water follows. So what is going to happen? Again, where will water go? That's the question. Water goes from low to high osmolarity. Low osmolarity, high osmolarity. Okay, Water goes that way. So what's going to happen to our ECF volume? Well, we're going to, we already have volume expansion. We get even more. So we're going to have an increased ECF volume. And ICF, we lose water. So ICF volume goes down. So what happens to our overall osmolarity? Again, it's, it's already increased. It's always your osmolarity is always just based on the insult, but then it's um, it's balanced out a little bit, so it's not as severe, and so now we have increased osmolarity. Finally, hypoosmotic volume expansion, something like SAIDH, where you're retaining too much water, so you expand, but your um all that water is going to dilute your it's lower your osmolarity. So your extra ECF has low lower osmolarity, higher volume. Water goes from high to, from low to high, okay. So that's where water is going to flow. So ECF volume goes down. Actually, ECF volume is going to be up, oh, excuse me, because I forgot that originally we have a volume expansion. And what's going to happen to ICF volume? ICF volume is going to go up too. Okay? So both of these go up, and then your osmolarity goes down. Okay. Finally, let's talk about sodium balance. Now, I want to say sodium levels play a huge role in determining blood volume and blood pressure. Why do I say that? Well, what is blood volume? Is it ECF or ICF? Remember, blood volume is ECF. And what was the main electrolyte that we said was in the ECF? Main electrolyte was sodium. And so these electrolytes are what's going to play a role in determining osmolarity. So sodium plays a huge role in determining ECF osmolarity. And we saw that ECF, that osmolarity is going to drive um, fluid shifts. Okay and it's going to determine the ECF volume. So thus, regulation of the sodium levels in the kidney is the most is the kidney's most important function. If you want to remain uh, remain in homeostasis, your kidney has to ensure that the amount of sodium that is excreted must match the sodium intake, okay? If you are keeping too much of the sodium, if you're not excreting, you're you're reabsorbing all that sodium guess what's going to happen to your volume? You're increasing ECF osmolarity, and then you're going to increase ECF volume. So you're going to have increased volume in your blood in your blood vessels, so that's going to increase blood pressure. And then, also another thing is you're going to have increased volume in the interstitial space, you're going to get edema, so that's no fun. Okay, If you, don't, if you are excreting too much sodium, on the other hand, then you're going to go decrease your blood pressure, you're going to decrease your blood volume, and that could be problematic as well. So you want to remain in homo homeostasis, you want to have a good fluid balance, and you, you need to um, regulate Na plus levels, sodium levels. So it's very important. The kidney has several mechanisms to regulate sodium levels, and the most important one is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the RAAS axis. We're going to discuss that later, we'll have a whole lecture on it. So uh, check it out later. And also don't forget AMP, atrial natriuretic peptide. Um, that was in the cardiac lecture. Do you remember what that does? Remember that was released when you're those atrial stretch, which basically tells you there's volume overload, and it tells your kidney to have naturesis and diuresis, which is fancy words for getting rid of salt and getting rid of water. So you're going to decrease that volume overload. So that decreases volume. The RAAS will increase blood volume. They work opposite directions. Finally, various sections of our nephron are going to reabsorb different amounts of sodium, okay? Because you don't want to excrete too much, you don't want to reabsorb too much. And when I say reabsorb different amounts, I, I mean different amounts of the amount of the total sodium that we that we originally filtered through the Bowman's capsule. So proximal commonly tubule absorbs the majority, 
thick extending lint. So this is a proximal color tubule, 75%. Lupa penley, thick extending lint, 15%. Early distal commulate tubule, 5 to 10%. So we're getting less and less, 15%. And eventually collecting tubule, 3.5%. All right, 3 to 5. Make this look nicer. Okay. However, notice that I've said this is the most important segment for regulation. You might wonder, why do I say that if there's only 3-5% to reabsorption here? How is that the most important? This is the most important segment for regulation because this is where um, reabsorption is regulated by aldosterone in the, re in the, the RRAS axis. Aldosterone, okay? Aldosterone acts here. So this is the very fine tuning of the whether you're gonna excrete sodium, whether you're gonna not, you're gonna reabsorb it. This is gonna give you that very, very last adjustment to make sure that you are in balance. The rest of this just depends on how much sodium is gonna is filtered. This is where your body controls everything, and so that's why I say it's the most important part. So that's it for our fluid balance and then sodium balance. Um, continue on to learn more about the nephron physiology. This will be a big, big part of the renal physiology as well as the whole um, whole renal section.